Thank you so much. I'm going to start with a very deep philosophical question. How do you feel about blue cheese? You know, Stilton, Roquefort, Gorgonzola. Most people have pretty strong opinions one way or the other. They love it or hate it. I'd like you to imagine someone who does not share your opinion on blue cheese and consider whether you'd be happy to have this person as a neighbor, a close friend, or a romantic partner. And keep these feelings in mind. Another controversial topic is abortion. Should it be legal or illegal? Think about your own opinion, and now consider whether you'd be happy to have someone who does not share your opinion on abortion as a neighbor, a close friend, or a romantic partner. Not quite the same as feeling on Stilton, right? These questions I've asked you are adapted from research by Linda Skitka at the University of Illinois. Her research has shown that there's something special about moral values, like opposition to abortion, as opposed to non-moral values, like your feelings about blue cheese. And as you might expect, disagreement on moral issues is much more damaging to social relationships than disagreement on non-moral issues. Why is it that a blue cheese lover is perfectly happy to befriend, marry, have kids with a blue cheese hater, but there exist anti-abortion extremists who think it's justifiable to kill another person in a church just because he disagrees with them? We've got to figure this out because we now live in a world where extremists, guided by their moral convictions, can do a lot of damage. We can start by asking ourselves how it is that we know something is right or wrong. And it turns out, actually, for a lot of people, this question doesn't even really make any sense, because people often experience moral beliefs as if they are objective facts about the world. So for someone uh, opposed to the death penalty, for example, the fact that it is wrong seems as obvious as the statement one plus one equals two. And we have some more evidence for this from research by Jeffrey Goodwin, now at the University of Pennsylvania. He ran some experiments where he presented his volunteers with a series of statements in the following categories. Facts, like Boston is further north than Los Angeles. Ethics, like opening gunfire on a crowded city street is wrong. Social norms, like wearing pajamas to a TED talk is wrong. And tastes, like classical music is better than rock music. And for each statement, subjects had to answer yes or no to the following question. Does this statement have a correct answer? And here's what they found. Not surprisingly, people felt most strongly that facts had correct answers while tastes did not. But notice that the statements of ethics looked more like facts than like tastes. And we see this overlap between facts and values in the brain as well. Sam Harris and colleagues scanned people's brains as they evaluated the truthfulness of factual statements, ethical statements, and religious statements. They found that a region of the brain called the medial prefrontal cortex was more active when people believed a statement to be true than to be false. But importantly, activity in this region did not differentiate between the different categories of moral beliefs, of, of, of different statements, so mathematical beliefs like two plus two equals four, showed a similar pattern of activity to ethical beliefs, like it's wrong to take pleasure at another's suffering. Now, the upshot of all this is we think that there's a right answer to moral questions. And here's the rub. If you and I disagree, and we both can't be right, well, who's right? And of course the answer is obvious. It's me who's right. Obviously, my facts trump your facts, and therefore, you must be stupid or unreasonable. And of course, this kind of language is all too common in politics these days. <laughs> but there's also a dangerous difference between disagreeing on facts and disagreeing on moral issues. See, if you think that one plus one equals three, I might think you're unreasonable or a little strange. But if you and I disagree on a moral issue, not only do I think you're unreasonable, but also a bad person, maybe even less than human. 
Moral values are like facts on steroids. They've got really strong emotions attached to them. And these emotions often come with a motivation to harm or eliminate the other side. And this, of course, is a huge problem. Because while we readily accept that tastes and opinions can change, facts are facts. I have my facts. You have your facts, and we're both so committed to those realities that it's senseless to expect either of us will ever change. Imagine trying to convince someone who's red, green, colorblind that these two circles are different colors. There is nothing you can say to this person to make him see the world the way you see it. And the same, unfortunately, appears to be true with differences in moral viewpoints. Values seem like facts. And facts, by definition, are fixed properties of reality. So where do we go from here? I grew up in the States, um, but I've been in Europe for about five years now, and I've sort of watched as the political situation has become increasingly insane, uh, increasingly extreme. And I really wanted to understand how it is that we, we get so attached to our moral values myself included. Um, and I'm a neuroscientist, so naturally I started poking around in people's brains. And I found out that our moral values are a lot less stable than we think. What if I told you that a pill could change your judgment of what is right and what is wrong? Or what if I told you that your sense of justice could depend on what you had for breakfast this morning? You're probably thinking by now this sounds like science fiction, right? Neurons in the brain use chemicals called neurotransmitters to talk to each other. Here we have two neurons. The gap between them is called a synapse. To transmit a message across the synapse, this one neuron must uh, release neurotransmitters into the synapse where they bind to receptors on the next neuron and propagate the message. The brain produces and releases these chemicals in response to various situations. My colleagues and I wanted to know whether manipulating people's brain chemistry could change the way they respond to moral situations. So in one study, we presented our volunteers with a moral dilemma like the following. There's a trolley, it's headed out of con control down some tracks towards five workers who will die if you do nothing. However, you can stop the trolley by pushing a man carrying a heavy briefcase in front of the trolley onto the tracks and he will die, but the five others will be saved. The question is, is it morally acceptable to harm this one person to save the others? And of course, there's no objectively correct answer to this question. Uh, in fact, there are two schools of moral thought that take opposing views. So the utilitarian school, rooted in the works of Jeremy Bentham, judges actions based on the outcomes they produce. So morally appropriate actions are those that result in the greatest good for the greatest number. On the other hand, the deontological school, grounded in the works of Immanuel Kant, judges the actions themselves. So there are right actions and wrong actions, and outcomes are irrelevant. In the dilemma I just described to you, Utilitarians would say it's appropriate to push the man in front of the trolley because more lives are saved in the end, whereas deontologists would say it's inappropriate because harming is fundamentally wrong. My colleagues and I asked 30 volunteers to make judgments in a series of moral dilemmas like the one I described to you. We wanted to see whether we could change people's judgments of right and wrong by manipulating a particular brain chemical called serotonin. We used a drug called a Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, or SSRI. It's similar to the antidepressant Prozac and basically works by enhancing the effects of serotonin in the brain. On one session, our volunteers made moral judgments while on the influence of the SSRI. And on the other session, they made moral judgments while on a placebo pill. And here's what we found. On the placebo session, our volunteers said it was appropriate to harm one to save many others in about 40% of the cases that we described to them. And when we gave them the SSRI, they were significantly less likely to say it was acceptable to harm one to save many. In other words, the drug made them less utilitarian. Now, take a second just to think about these results. The debate between utilitarians and deontologists has been raging for hundreds of years. We gave people a single pill, and without even knowing it, they gave different answers to this question of whether or not it's okay to harm one to save many others. 
So could the difference between people like Bentham and people like Kant boil down to serotonin levels in their brains? And um, on a more serious note, what are the implications of this for other kinds of ethical questions? So taking this idea further, my colleagues also looked at whether uh, serotonin levels influence the way that we respond to being treated unfairly. We used a game from economics called the ultimatum game. There are two players, a proposer and a responder. The proposer suggests a way to split a sum of money with the responder. The responder can either accept the offer, in which case both players are paid accordingly, or he can reject the offer, in which case neither player gets any money. Many studies have now shown that responders will typically reject offers they perceive to be unfair, which makes sense. I think a lot of us would rather have nothing than let someone who's treated us unfairly get the lion's share. Um, in our study, we wanted to see whether we could shift around people's responses to unfairness by changing their serotonin levels. We did this by changing people's diet. So the raw ingredient for serotonin is the amino acid tryptophan, and we all must constantly replenish our supply of tryptophan by eating protein-rich foods. In the lab, we are able to manipulate serotonin levels um, by giving people a protein shake that lacks tryptophan. And on our placebo control session, we give people a shake that looks and tastes the same, except for it does contain two and a half grams of added tryptophan. And we gave people these drinks and had them play the ultimatum game in the role of responder. And we measured rejection rates for unfair, medium, and fair offers. On placebo, um, you can see people reject a lot of the unfair offers. They hardly ever reject the fair 50-50 splits. And here's what happens when we lower serotonin levels. Rejection rates go up for the unfair offers. Now, take a second again to just pause and think about this. The only difference between these two treatments is two and a half grams of tryptophan in the diet. That's it. Our volunteers don't feel any different on the two sessions, and they don't notice any changes in their behavior. And yet, this subtle difference was enough to change the way that they responded to being treated unfairly. Now, it's important to point out, in these lab studies, we artificially manipulate serotonin levels. But out in the real world, serotonin levels do fluctuate naturally in response to things like changes in diet and stress levels. What this means is, our moral values could be shifting a little bit all the time without us even knowing it. And we do have evidence that this kind of thing is happening out in the real world. Shai Danziger and colleagues um, looked at uh, parole board rulings, judges' rulings of whether to grant parole to prisoners. Here we have the proportion of favorable rulings on the vertical axis, and on the bottom we have basically time of day. Uh, here on the vertical axis are the judges' meal breaks. Yep, it turns out if you're coming up for parole, you are more likely to be granted parole if your hearing takes place after the judge had a snack. I hope that this worries you a little bit. <laughs> and uh, more seriously, I, I hope that I've convinced you that our, our moral values are a lot less stable than they appear to be. And this is important because it turns out that simply believing that moral values are changeable as opposed to fixed can have dramatic effects on our willingness to cooperate and compromise. The Israel-Palestine conflict is one of the biggest ideological clashes of our time. It's resulted in thousands of deaths on both sides, huge costs in quality of life. Uh, Aaron Halperin, Carol Dweck, and colleagues recently reported that beliefs about whether groups have a fixed versus changeable nature can influence Israeli and Palestinian attitudes towards each other and their willingness to compromise for peace. In their experiment, Israelis and Palestinians were randomly assigned to read one of two articles. One article suggested that aggressive groups have a fixed nature, and the other article suggested that aggressive groups have a changeable nature. Those who read the article about changeable groups were more likely to be willing to meet with the other side and hear their point of view, and more willing to compromise on issues like the status of Jerusalem and settlements in the West Bank. What this means is, if we can wrap our heads around the idea that moral values are not fixed, but can change, we're more likely to listen to each other. And here's a crazy idea. 
If pills can shift our moral values, what if negotiators popped a few moral enhancers before heading to the table? Such an intervention might make it easier for opponents to see each other's side. Now, of course, we have a long way to go before we fully understand which brain chemicals influence which kinds of moral beliefs. But I do think it's plausible that one day we will have the expertise to identify different brain systems that drive preferences for conflicting ethical principles. As long as we believe, falsely, I might add, that our moral values are unshakable. We will continue to invest our resources in fighting with each other, rather than searching for a middle way. Instead, can't we cultivate a healthy sense of skepticism for our own sense of right and wrong? Because once we accept that our moral values can be altered by factors beyond our awareness and control, maybe we'll become a little less attached to them. And the sooner that we can let go of this attachment, the better, because we've got some scary, scary problems threatening our collective survival, and we're not solving them because we're sitting around bickering with each other, fighting with each other, you know, drowning in this quicksand of hate and fear. This, this hate and this fear—they're blinding us to our common humanity. And the amazing things that we can achieve if we put our differences aside and our heads and hearts together. People, it's it's time to open our eyes, to open ourselves, and and to wake up. Thank you. <laughs>